So welcome everyone to our spring Cone Health Engagement Series event. I'm so happy that everybody's here. Um, and I'd like to thank my diet partner, Mary Jo, um, and to the entire uh, healthcare system for supporting the uh, chess event. So, uh, you guys know Jonathan? So, uh, many of you may know, or some of you may not know, that our Cone Health Engagement Series, our chess events, started out of our Physician Leadership Academy as one of the projects and has uh, now been in effect. Are we in year three now? Uh, December 2014, this is our 10th chess uh, lecture. Yeah, our 10th event. So we're so glad you could be here for, we'll call it our 10th anniversary. So our 10th meeting. And we do these quarterly, and we're glad you could be here for this event. I'm Mary Jo Cagle. I'm the Chief Clinical Officer for Cone Health. Before I turn this over to Jonathan to introduce our events for tonight, I will remind everyone that we take a vacation for summer because we hope that you're gonna take some vacation time this summer. But we will have our next event in September, and I just wanna do a little teaser preview for our September event, which is already on the books and planned, and our wonderful staff will be sending out Save the Dates very soon. So I hope that you all have heard of the author, Abraham Verchese, who wrote the book Cutting for Stone. Yeah, he is a professor of internal medicine at Stanford University, and he will be with us in September. Uh, if you haven't seen his YouTube video about the ritual of the physical exam, I would invite you sometime between now and September to just uh, Google that and watch it. And you'll get a treat and a little bit of preview about what you're going to have the delight of being able to uh, be part of when we have him here in September. So with that, Dr. Barry, I'll turn this over to you to introduce us to our guest speakers for tonight. And folks, thank you for being here and welcome. Thank you, Mary Jo. So a couple of questions. Um, what, what a great audience. Uh, how many people have attended one or more chess talks? Wow, excellent. Um, another question. How many people are within 10 years of retirement or thinking? <laughs> OK, <laughs> got it. Um, so you know, planning these talks. Planning these talks takes about a year. Um, a lot of thought goes into them. And the way I came up with this topic was about two or three years ago, I was up in New York uh, visiting my son, who was living in Manhattan. And uh, we had a little fa father-son time. We're walking around the financial district. And my son says, so dad, have you thought about retirement? I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you always have a plan for something. You know, what are your plans for retirement? I said, I have no idea. Um, and so that kind of got the, the wheels turning. And then a few months later, just fortuitously, uh, Abby's name came up. And uh, we connected and had about an hour conversation while I was in the car driving down to Charlotte. And that was the genesis of this talk. Um, because a lot of people financially plan for retirement. Not many people think about what's going to happen on the other side of retirement. And I think the people who do are probably happier on the other side. Um, so. I want to welcome uh, Coach Abby Donnelly from the Leadership Legacy Group, talking about the secrets uh, to a meaningful, thoughtful next chapter. Uh, just logistically, she's graciously agreed to um, a book signing afterwards, so there are books on the back table. Um, and then she told me that uh, somebody who we all know very well, Tim Rice, uh, CEO Emeritus, uh, used Abby's services to make the transition. So it was a natural. So with that, I'm going to have Tim introduce Abby, and then we can get the show started. Thanks. Well, first of all, I'm nervous and humbled. Um, 
And you say, why are you nervous? Because I've spoken to very large groups before. But usually, those of you in the room, I either was paying you, so you had to listen to me. <laughs> oh, you're there for an annual medical staff meeting, and so you're there for the food and stayed around to just kind of hear remarks. So this is, you're here because you want to be, and that scares the heck out of me. And if you happen to see my wife, Carolyn, she's out on the golf course right now, with, actually with Carolyn Green, Art's wife. I told her she couldn't come. I said, it's a few physicians. It's no big deal. So no, you can't come. So if you see her, that's my story. And, and, and you're sticking to it as well. So let me, um, let me start by talking about today. Today's been a great day, just a great day. I had the opportunity to, uh, to this afternoon, this evening, now I'm a little bit upset at you. Tonight my wine club is ha having their annual game night. So I'm part of a guys, guy, you know, it's an only guys thing, so it's a little, little sexist group that get together and drink wine. And we do it at restaurants throughout the year. We bring the wine, we pair it with food, and we have a good time, and somebody's in charge every month to set this up. Well, the May meeting is always the game meeting. So everybody donates whatever they've shot during the year, and we use a chef to help, and we prepare it, and we have our meal. So I was working on this, not knowing it was the same night. In fact, back up, I killed a moose last September. Poor innocent moose, he got in my way of my gun up in British Columbia. My brother's lived in British Columbia for 25 years, has tried to get me to come up moose hunting with him, which I did, and guess what? I shot a moose. So a bunch of moose meat came my way about December. And you've got to realize the size of these guys. I mean, they're just massive. So I have these moose roasts that are this big, and you know, I've been trying to use this moose up. So tonight was using up part of my moose. So I took the moose roast and took a bunch of pheasants and stuff like that. So at 9 o'clock this morning, we started working in a commercial kitchen. I can't tell you who's or where because it's against all kinds of health department rules to bring in wild game into this commercial kitchen. But Brad Siemens was very helpful with the painted plate. <laughs> he's part of the club. And so we spent all day long chopping and cutting, and he's doing a little uh, uh, moose uh, carpaccio is one of the courses on a little arugula with a little shaved, little, little fennel on it, a little shaved arugula, a little shaved um, parmesan. And we have a duck course, and we have a pheasant course, and we have crabs that somebody else brought from the coast. So I had a great day, because I always wanted to work in a kitchen. So working alongside of Brad's staff and learning how to prep some of the stuff and what he's going to do is great. But then I pouted all afternoon, because they're also pairing all these great wines. I'm not there, so I'm missing out. But then I walk in tonight and see all this. So what a, what a great day. I tell you that because, you know, Tomorrow, I'm flying to DC early, and I'm in an American Hospital Association meeting all day, get back. It's going to be a great day. And it's going to be so different than today. And then Wednesday, I have nothing planned at all. But by Wednesday morning, I'll have a plan for Wednesday, and I'll do something on Wednesday. And Wednesday will be a great day. So I've kind of approached this now that um, I have this cornucopia of opportunities of things that I can do on any given day. But when I was thinking about retirement a number of years ago, I realized um, what most of us do is we spend a great deal of time thinking about the financial side of retirement, which is a pretty scary thought. I remember when Carolyn said to me, okay, next year I know how money comes out of the checkbook, but I don't understand how money gets into the checkbook. <laughs> so that's kind of scary, and you work a lot on the financial side. But when I thought about it, we really don't spend much time thinking about the other side. You know, what are we going to do? How are we going to stay engaged? I can't sit still, so that was not going to be a great plan. And it's one of the biggest decisions we make. Now, people have different opportunities. As physicians, many of you will have opportunities to maybe plug in a part-time role, don't take call, slow down, kind of change your schedules a little bit. I didn't really have that opportunity. As CEO, it was either going to be 60 hours a week or zero. Um, so I was trying to figure out what my new life was going to be like. Also, um, I was doing it at a relatively young age. I was fortunate to have been conservative and invested early on, part of an old retirement program that Cohn doesn't even offer anymore. So, and also, my father ran a ranch and cattle farm, and he retired at 58. And I looked at what my dad had done, and he'd spent another 32 years hunting, fishing, doing stuff he really enjoyed, traveling. And I thought, wow, that's cool. He really had kind of the second phase of his life, because he worked his butt off running the farm and the ranch. So I kind of had this 58, 60, 62 kind of time frame in mind. And I realized that also that I was going to retire when I didn't have a lot of colleagues retiring at the same age. So, and I don't have family around here. My family's all on the West Coast. So what am I going to do? 
So, um, again, we worked on this. We'd done a lot of work. The Wall Street Journal's had some really good series on planning for retirement. And part of the series has been financial planning, but also a lot of it's been what are people doing in retirement? What's your second, you know, your third chapter, whatever chapter it is for you? So I started to explore this idea of the next chapter. And I had lunch with somewhere around eight to 10 people that I knew who had retired and admired and kind of had looked like they had successful retirements. Everybody had the same comment, you know, don't do anything for six months. Don't let anybody talk you into going on a board or, you know, do anything, just say a pause, uh, take some time to figure out what you want to do. But there were a few people who had been very intentional. One individual who had retired, he and his wife surveyed the part of the country they wanted to live in, and then they visited Asheville and Greensboro, Charlotte, and they had a, a formula for how they visited the community. They wanted to belong to a club, so they'd go to a country club or two in the community, get a tour, they'd hire, they'd have a realtor show them around real estate, but they're very intentional about where they might think about going. Looked at the airport, uh, for, because that was important to them. So after discussions with those, I kind of started looking around in our community, and I knew Abby, I've known Abby for years and years, but never have worked directly with Abby, and found out that Abby had this kind of a niche that she was working on of helping people transition, helping family-owned businesses transition from the dad or mom, whoever ran it, giving it over to the next generation, and also helping people think about their own retirement and their own situation. So I thought, well, I've had a professional coach before in terms of leadership coaches. Why not have a retirement coach? So that's when I uh, talked to Abby about doing this work with me, and she gave me examples of what she had done, and I said, well, let's try it. So that was part of the process. Also, part of it was setting a date certain, which was tough. But I set a date in stone that I said, this is the date that I'm leaving. And also, it helped Terry, because Terry was here with the idea that if things worked out, Terry would have a chance to succeed me. So Terry wasn't going to stay forever. If I didn't have a date certain, we wouldn't have been able to keep him. And I thought, in terms of succession planning, that was key. And that might be key for your situation or for your practice to be able to be fairly certain about the date or a window of dates when you might want to think about retirement so they can develop a replacement plan. Because I got news to you. None of us are irreplaceable. And I use the analogy of, I used to do this when leadership talks of the Indianapolis Colts. Remember when Peyton Manning got hurt? What did they have as a backup? They didn't. They went from really, really great to nothing. I mean, look what's happened in Denver. So guess what? Your quarterback's going to get hurt. Something's going to happen. You better have a backup plan. Guess what? Your senior exec, your doc, or whatever are going to retire. You better have a backup plan. So I think I owed it, I thought I owed it to Cone to be fairly explicit about my date so they could be developing that backup plan so that when I left, there was a good succession plan in place. So let me let Abby Donnelly, my friend, come up and describe a little bit about the process. Um, Two sentence about Ab seconds about Abby. Abby is well known in our community. She's an executive coach, has done a lot of work across the community. She's on a bank board here in our community. Um, she had done a lot of work in the leadership coaching area. She has published, as you can see. And this, she's one of the few people I know that specifically has worked on this idea of helping people uh, transition their career. So Abby. Thank you, Tim. Um, so what I want to do is share some demographics with you. Um, there's a lot of stuff that you know about the demographics, and I'm going to kind of use that to shape the, the scenario. So as you probably know, the baby boomers are turning 71 this year, right? So there's about 10,000 boomers a day that are turning 71. That's an amazing number. But the thing that's most interesting to me about that is that no, none of them want to talk about the word retirement. When you get out there and you talk to folks, most of them are saying, I've got another 20 years of good health to live. And the word retirement scares me. It reminds me of what my parents did. And I remember what they did. They stopped working and then they died. They sat on a rocker on the front porch and they died. I don't want that and I'm not going to do that. So retirement today is no longer the cool word. You heard Tim talk about next chapter. That's the language that people are using. And there's this whole organization out in um, San Francisco called Encore.org, and they may have moved to Washington by now. But they have put their whole focus on how do you help 
aging boomers figure out what they want to do with the next 20 years of their life. And so when I was thinking about starting this business, I wanted to figure out, is there a market for this? Can I really make a living doing this kind of work? And I love the work, but are there enough people that are going to invest in it? And so I went out and I interviewed about 50 business owners, presidents, CEOs, and some nonprofit leaders across all different industries. And when I went out and interviewed them, I had a whole series of questions. I spent about an hour with each one of them. And one of the questions that I asked them was, so, what are you planning to do in retirement? Do you know yet? Every one of the first 25 that I talked to said, absolutely, I know exactly what I'm going to do in retirement. So I said, great, what is it? And can anyone guess what the top three and almost consistent only themes were that people said? Anyone got a guess? Well, you all talked at once. I couldn't hear anybody. Travel. Travel, right? Travel is number one. Not necessarily in that order, but one of them. Good. What else? Play golf every day. Grandchildren. Grandchildren. That's it. You got it. Okay, so that was the traditional answer that I got from everybody. Well, the research actually doesn't bear that out. The research says that that stuff is fun. It's interesting. But it will not last you beyond about six months. Because after that, you are going to be so bored. The research actually from the Harvard Public School of Health says that when you take a hard charging, like many of you in this room, a hard charging professional, and you give them six months of retirement, the rate of obesity, drug abuse, alcoholism, and depression skyrocket. And once that skyrockets, you can't recover from that very easily and very quickly. So some people do finally get it together. But why would you want to go through that? And I couldn't understand why all these people that I was interviewing were saying, these are the three things I want to do, and I'm going to be very happy doing them. So I decided I'm going to change the questions. So I'm a statistician, right? I know that if you ask a question a certain way, you'll get this answer. If you change the way you ask it, you'll get this answer. So I started changing the interview questions. And I started off by prefacing it with, I've done a lot of research on this. And interestingly, the Harvard School of Public Health talks about the skyrocketing rate of obesity, drug abuse, alcoholism, and depression when hard-charging executives just move into retirement without a clear plan of what they want to do, and they think they're going to be excited about spending more time with family, playing golf every day, and um, traveling. And behind closed doors, one-on-one, -on -one, what I found was that then most of them would tell me, you know what, I'm really worried too. I'm incredibly uncomfortable with what I'm going to do. Some of them talked about their marriage and how they weren't sure how that was going to weather the retirement. You know, what am I going to do sitting home looking at my wife all day or my husband all day? Some of them were concerned about their family and them demanding more time than they wanted to give them. Some of them were saying, you know, I know I love golf, but I just can't imagine playing golf every single day. And then what am I going to do? So the reality is, in the research that I've done and what I've seen from most, is that after six months, and that's why when Tim was talking about the advice that people gave him, don't do anything for six months, it's a huge risk to not do anything for six months. Because once you do that, first of all, the first thing that happens is that you get bored. Really, really, really bored. And in fact, I had a guy that called me up. He's, he's someone that I have known for many, many years. And he was in a job, and that job had a very long commute, and it was painful. And he was about 60, 62, and he just decided, you know what, I don't want to do this anymore. So he left the job into retirement, because that's the cool thing to say if you, you know, leave your job. But when he exited into retirement, he decided he wasn't going to do anything else. And so he took that time, and he's just going to you know, kind of hang out and have fun. He said, it's going to be great. I'm going to sleep late. I'm going to do whatever I want to do. I can run around in my underwear all day if I want to. So he decided that that was going to be his next six months, and he'd see what unfolded. Well, what ended up happening with him was he came back to me six months later, and he said, I'm going out of my mind. The problem that he had, in addition to the boredom, though, is that all those connections and all those relationships that he had spent 30, 40 years of his career building have now started to separate because his identity was all wrapped up in the business. And so when he introduced himself, he would say, I'm the president of or the EVP of whatever. And now what does he say? 
He says, I'm the person that used to be an EVP, or I used to be a physician, or something like that. And it doesn't hold the same weight. In addition to that, all of the relationships that he had that were really, really tight when he was working full time, they started to dissipate. They weren't gone, but they started to dissipate. And the experience of those relationships changed. And so now the idea of calling those people up and saying, hey, I'm starting to think about a next career, my next chapter. These are the kinds of things I might want to do. It got really scary to talk about that kind of stuff because where was he six months ago or what was he thinking about even 12 months ago? And so he was uncomfortable doing it. Well, if he had done it before he left the job or if he had done it right after he left his job, it might have been much less scary for him. The other thing that's really interesting, and my father had this experience. My father's been retired now for a long time. He's 85 and he retired at 50. 59 and a half, and he retired at 59 and a half. He was working for IBM. And my dad said, you know, I want to work until I'm 60 years old, kind of like Tim. And uh, IBM came to him and said, well, uh, we're going to offer you a package. And my dad was 59, and he said, yeah, thanks. I don't really want a package. And he said, I'd like to work for another year. And they said, yeah, we don't really think so. We're going to offer you this package, and we'd like you to take it. And so my dad said, no, you know, another year or two would be good for me. And they said, here's the deal. You either take the package now, or you work another year and you get no package. And the, the package was worth a year's worth of salary plus ongoing benefits well into retirement. So my dad's no dummy. He said, you know what? I think I'm going to take the package. And so when you make those kinds of decisions, but you haven't had the time to prepare, then you're, you, don't, you don't have the, the framework to move forward. So what I notice is that when people do retire and they don't find that meaningful and rewarding what's next, you know how it is in, in any of the work that you do, that the work expands to fill the available space, right? So if you have two hours to do something, it might take you two hours, even though you're very efficient and in a normal situation, you can be done in 10 minutes. But the work you know, fills it. So what I find with a lot of people that are retired is that it can take them all day to get up and get ready and then go to the gym because they like to work out every day and now they have the time. And then they go to lunch and they have a nice leisurely lunch. Then they run an errand, maybe stop at the grocery store, pick up some medication at Rite Aid or something like that. Then they go home and it's nearly dinner time and they start preparing dinner. And then they look at me and they say, I don't know how I ever got any work done because their full time is being spent in the activities. So that's one group of people. The other group of people that I run into a lot are the people that say, I don't want to take six months off. I want to have something really meaningful, but I don't know what it is, so I'm going to grab the first available opportunity that's presented to me. And they run to something that shows up. And Tim didn't talk about this much today, but I'll share. I hope it's OK. He hasn't nodded his head yes yet. <laughs> Well, one of the things that we talked about when we were working together is what are the opportunities and the options? And the thing that's fascinating about this process is that most of us see the world through the lens that we've always spent our life and our career in. And so that's the way you see it. And so as Tim and I were talking about some of the pieces of the model that I'll share with you shortly, what I discovered was he saw the world through the lens of healthcare because he's got a very broad healthcare experience and you would expect that and had no idea that there would be so many people out there that had been watching him, that saw the kind of work that he did, that saw the kind of experience that he brought, the mind that he has, that would be saying to him, oh my gosh, if we could get a Tim Rice to engage with us, wouldn't that be fantastic? So he got calls and opportunities to go to China. He got opportunities to work at Duke. He was contacted by people that he might never have imagined would have sought him out. Well, if you take the first opportunity that comes, there was a woman that I know who was retiring. She had a very high level position in the school system. And she was ready to retire and she had planned the retirement piece of it, but not necessarily specifically what she wanted to do next. And someone came along and said, we want to offer you this position. And she was so excited about it that she took it. But she hadn't taken into account all the other ways that that position was going to impact the rest of her life. When you're working all the time and you add something else in, 
no big deal, you just add it in. But when it is the only thing that you're doing now, except for the rest of your life, it can really get in the way of doing all the other things that you want to do. And so she did that for a year or two, and then she moved on, because it wasn't allowing her to live the full retirement life that she wanted. So if you throw yourself into the first thing that comes along, you may end up regretting it. A lot of folks out there that are talking about what you do in retirement are saying, do a trial and error, test some things out. And I always recommend that you are much, much better off if you're very intentional and very focused on the process so that it's based on who you are and what really ignites your passion and your interest. So this process is stressful, and it's stressful for everybody. And if they tell you that it's not, they're probably lying. So what I want to do is um, share some of the parts of the process that I go through so you can get a sense of it. And my hope is that you'll pull some things from it, that if you were one of those people that raised your hands, that you're within 10 years of retirement, that maybe there will be something here that you can get started thinking about now. Um, and I did want to add an addendum. The other 25 people that I, uh, the first 25 people that I interviewed when I was doing the research, many of them have come back to me and said, Abby, you were right. You were absolutely right. I did what I thought was going to be best for me, but without having a meaningful and rewarding plan for what's next, I went through a process of depression. I was bored out of my mind. It was very stressful, and there probably wasn't a reason that it had to be. So I feel a little bit vindicated in all that. So let me walk you through the model. Um, on your seats in front of you is a picture of the model, and I'm going to share some of the key components of that. I'm not going to go through everything in great detail, but I do want to share some things with you that I think will be helpful. Um, what you see over on the left-hand side under discovery is the first phase of the process. And this is, in my mind, the most exciting part. I love this part of the process because in this phase, what we're looking at is first, we want to understand what are your strengths. Now, some of you may be sitting here thinking, I know my strengths. I've been getting performance feedback since I was you know, 21 years old. But the thing that I find most of the time when I do this work is, first of all, your strengths that you get in those situations are in the context of your professional career as you're working through your advancement. But when you get into this phase of life, most of, most of the people I work with are not working for money anymore. They may want to make money. They may need to make money. But they're not choosing what to do because they need the money or they need to make a lot of money. And so they're at a place in their career where they can really choose what are the strengths I love to use. And so in doing so, this process, we often discover some underutilized strengths. We often discover some unappreciated strengths. And most of the folks I work with find this process to be incredibly enlightening because they see themselves in very, very new and different ways. And in seeing themselves in those ways, it opens up opportunities to do things, not only using their favorite strengths that they might have only gotten a chance to use you know, for a couple of hours a day, they can now use all the time, but they can use them in ways that are much, much more meaningful and powerful for them and the organization or the people or the institution that they're working with. So whether they call it work or not. So that's really exciting to me. The other piece that we look at is what are you passionate about? And most people, when I'm talking about going through this process, they say, I don't know what I'm passionate about. Or they know what it is, but they don't think they can make a career of it. So for example, one of the folks I worked with a number of years ago said, Abby, the only thing I'm really passionate about that I know of is fishing, and I don't want to take people out on a boat and fish. So we ended up talking about what is it about fishing that really got him excited. And what we discovered was the fishing itself was fun, but it was really about being out in the open, being on the water, having this whole day to yourself where it can be peaceful and you can reflect. And what I discovered was he was a visionary. And his most creative ideas came out when he was alone, sometimes in the shower, sometimes on the water. And so when we talked about what he was passionate about, what we discovered was it was the opportunity to create a grand vision, something really, really special. And the way that he did that best was when he created an environment that cultivated that. So 
Does that mean that he's going to go out and find a job where he's going to cultivate that? Not necessarily. But whatever he did next needed to include something like that, something that opened up that possibility and that opportunity in some meaningful way. And so the passions, I've got a whole boatload of tools to help people discover their strengths and to help people discover their passions. And so we use those tools to try to get to the nitty gritty of those things. And most of the time as I'm going through this process, people are kind of giddy with excitement because it's, they're seeing themselves in the world, as I said, in some new and different ways. The third piece that we look at is lifestyle priorities. And that sounds pretty straightforward, it is, but the lifestyle priorities that are important to you at age 35 are different than the ones that are important to you at age 50, and they're different again at age 65. And so figuring out for yourself what are those lifestyle priorities that are really going to matter, that's what's so powerful. So for some people, there are things like, you know, I need to, may, I need to bring in still $60,000 a year for the next six years until I reach, you know, until I tap my retirement plan or um, I can start pulling out of my IRA or something like that. For some people, it's things like, I want to have the flexibility. I had a client who, um, he was working for a company that was sold, and he was the CEO of the company, and he had to figure out what was going to be next for him. And so most people told him, oh, be a consultant. But he really wanted to do something a little bit more meaningful. And for him, what he said that he wanted to do was he wanted to spend three or four months a year doing work. He wanted to be paid for it. He said, if I'm going to invest the time, I want to get paid for it. But he wanted to also be able to take off a month or two at a time in order to travel. He and his wife loved to travel. But in the past, all they were able to do with travel was a week or two here or there because that's all the time that they were able to get off from his job. And so now he wanted to be able to do some extended travel. Well, there are a lot of jobs that you can't get because you're going to take two months off or four months off a year. But there's a lot of work and a lot of possibilities you can do when you're age 65 or 70 and you're saying, this is how I want to contribute. People will work with you in all kinds of ways if you've got that kind of a, a background and a reputation. And that's what he ended up doing. He found a way, a mechanism where he could work for a company, but he also had four months off a year and that's what he did was travel. So it could be things like that with your lifestyle priorities. Um, it could also be, where do you want to live and where do you want to work? So any of those kinds of things come together. And when we pull all those things together, what it culminates in is what I call your, your story, your narrative. And the idea of the narrative is you don't necessarily know yet what you want to go do, but you build a conversation piece where you can go out and start talking to people. So you tell them, these are the kinds of strengths that I love to use and I'm looking for an opportunity to do that. And I've got a long track record of success doing these kinds of things. And I'm passionate about this. And you build a story around that that opens up enough possibility, but also is narrow enough that you don't get wild requests from people that are way off target and way off base of what you really is gonna resonate for you. And then you get out there and phase two is the exploration. So if you look at what you're doing in phase two, you're expanding your worldview because you're out there talking to people. And when you talk to people and you realize all these amazing things that are going on in our world that when we go to work every day, we don't get access to, we don't connect with, we don't see very often. So now we're out there talking to people. And one of the, um, the requests that I made for Tim, the homework assignment that I gave him was, I want you to make a list of everything, every organization, every person, every type of piece of work, if you will, that you think is interesting. No barriers at all, anyone and anything that you think is interesting. Because if those things interest you or intrigue you in some way, you should be out there talking to people about it at this stage. And so that's what he did. He went out and he talked to a whole bunch of people that he thought were interesting. And what he found through that process was that the world continued to open up. And I think that it creates such tremendous possibility and opportunity. So you get out there, you expand your worldview, you make connections with people that are doing interesting things, and you refine and validate and confirm the, the picture that you have of what's next. And invariably what happens, and I've been doing this for 10 years, more than that, invariably what happens is something or things show up that you look at and you say, now that that I'm interested in. We need to talk. 
and then you build into that what that might look like. And because you're at this stage of your life, you have some negotiating room, you know? When you're just getting a job out of college, you can't negotiate the level that you can negotiate now. But now you've got a um, history of success, you can negotiate. And so you start building those, those particular options. And so that's the discovery process. And then the last phase of it is where you drop everything through the filter. So now the opportunities are showing up and you've got your filter, you've got your must-haves, those are non-negotiables, you've got the things that intrigue you, and then you've got sort of the boundaries around that. And you drop it through the filter and you figure out what shows up and then you go after that. And the vast majority of the time, after about six months of this process, all the way through, you may or may not know exactly what it is that you're going to do next, but you have a really clear picture of the direction that you want to go, and there's a momentum. And I talk about the fulcrum, and the fulcrum is my favorite moment in the process. And I tell everybody when I'm working with them up front that you know, the fulcrum is the moment when you and I both know that you see a vision that's very exciting. You may not have the opportunity laid out yet, but you see it. And I'll tell you a quick story about that. So I was working with a CEO of a company in Winston-Salem, and he had done a phenomenal job. It's a construction company. He had done a phenomenal job of preparing for uh, succession. So he had all the right people in place. And when he came to me, he said, I could really use some help figuring out not only what's next for me, because that's important, but also how do I extricate myself from this emotionally? Because this is my baby. I've been running this company since I was in my 20s. And I've got really good people, but I don't want to stick around too long. I don't want to make their life miserable because I won't leave. And you know, Tim, to his credit, absolutely did not want to do that. And so um, I was working with this gentleman. And we were about three months in, and he's getting antsy. He's like, what am I going to know? What am I going to know? What am I going to th hit the fulcrum? And uh, I said, just bear with me. We're, we're really close, because I know the process, so I can tell when it's about to happen. And he said, well, I'm ready. I'm ready. So I said, OK, just hol hold on. It'll just be you know, a few more meetings. And about two meetings later, um, the, the hallway that my office was off of is a long, narrow hallway, and the door to, into the office area is at the end. And I was waiting for him in the hallway because it was about time for him to show up for our meeting. And I was standing there, and all of a sudden, he comes up to the door, he flings the door open, he marches through, and I could see his face was all lit up. He was a bullient. It was an amazing um, look on his face. And he smiles at me, big, broad smile, and he said, I hit the fulcrum. So what happened was he had recognized that there was a really exciting future for him. And he went forward into that. And one of the things that came out of it was he, he and his wife decided that in addition to the home that they had, they wanted to buy a second condo in a place that was going to be um, downtown, really exciting for them. And they had just put the down payment on it, and they got it. And so he was excited about that. But it shifted everything in his energy. So that's the kind of thing that, I mean, for me, that's my mission in life, is to, to take people through this process. Where I got started on this was years and years ago. I was working for Procter & Gamble for 14 years, and I was doing you know, long days, probably not as long as most of you, but long days nonetheless. And I was traveling all over the place. And it got to the point where it's like, I love this work, but I really want to do something different. And when I finally got myself uh, to a place where I felt confident enough to walk away, and I felt like I could make enough money to kind of survive and hopefully thrive over time, um, I, I took the plunge and I left. And that was in 2001. And having taken myself through this process and then seen how really rewarding it was, it's like, I want to do this all the time. So most of my clients fit into this category, but you know, some of them are, are you know, early 50s, 60s, or early 50s and 55 years old, and they're not ready to retire, but they are ready for something else. So um, anyway, I will turn it back over to Tim for some closing comments, and then I'll be back up again to give you some uh, final words. Thanks, Abby. So I'm going to give you some thoughts on the process and just reflect on what she said. So, you know, she recommended going talking to people and meeting with people. Everybody's very willing to do that. I didn't run into any individual that said, no, I don't want to meet with you, I don't want to talk to you. One of the recommendations that Abby had for me was to develop kind of a board of trustees for Tim. To, I don't have a better phrase for it. 
But I have. I have a group of about six people that I keep in touch with that will go out and have a beer, kind of check in, what's going well. They're very interested in what I'm doing. And so that's, that's been a kind of helpful. And they push me to think about things and actually have made introductions to people that I haven't thought of. So I'm pretty intentional about doing that in every quarter, almost like I had a board that I answered to and I had a calendar that I kept to. So every quarter I look at the list and have I had a beer with this guy? Have we met? Have we had coffee? So I kind of check in with these people. And everybody's willing to do this. I mean, everybody's interested in the, you being successful in that next chapter. I got good feedback from Abby's work. Um, she did kind of a 360 a little bit with some of my friends, uh, peers at work, my wife. And I got good, good feedback on what I was good at and also what to avoid. So uh, that was very helpful. Abby knows my wife, Carolyn, very well now. She asked me to develop a mission statement. And this, that sounded kind of hokey to me, but I worked on it. I worked on it hard. And so my mission statement says, and I pulled this out after three, four years now, and I keep this, be challenged physically. That's important to me to do something several days a week so that it's, and I've had to vary that because I can't run like I used to, so I'm doing a lot of other stuff. Be challenged mentally. So I joined a book club, guys I didn't know, uh, that challenged me to read things that I wouldn't have thought about reading in, in many ways, and be challenged socially. So that's an interesting one. So I have tried to go places that I wouldn't necessarily have gone in my typical sphere of people that I worked with or, or socialized with. So that's led me to be a member and shop at the Renaissance uh, Center. Uh, it's led me to volunteer, and we do Meals on Wheels occasionally, uh, and to enjoy some things like that, that that kind of push us a little bit socially. To lead a life that makes a difference to family, friends, and communities, and tr to treat all with fairness and empathy. So that's me. So that's what I wanted to aspire to, and I keep that out and look at it from time to time. Um, I made a list of goals, and I'll share some of those and tell you tell what worked and what didn't work. Some other thoughts, though, is I've learned in this thing about six months relevance and how fast that goes by. That's very true. Um, I'm doing some work now nationally with a couple of groups, and this will be my last year because I don't know the people to call anymore. I'm not relevant in the field like I was three years ago. It, it happens quickly. I used to know every hospital CEO in North Carolina. Now I don't because of turnover, transition, retirements. So you've got to realize that about your own self is that that is going to tail off fairly quickly. And I do, so I'm trying to figure out what, you know, what's I'm gonna, what am I going to pick up as that kind of tails off. I found that we need to be proactive. If we just sat around and waited for people to call us for dinner, for socialization, we might be sitting there with the phone pretty dead. So we try to be proactive about friends, people we haven't seen for a while that we want to see. I just mentioned to Bill Bowman that my wife and Gay are friends, and we drove by their house and said, hey, we want to have dinner with them. So we actually will write that down someplace so we're intentional about not just thinking that Bill's going to call me sometime about having dinner, because he won't. <laughs> Look for interesting people. So I, you know, we all know interesting people. I'll give you an example. Alan Johnson from the News and Record and I did some work together years and years ago. And so I reached out about, I don't know, six, nine months ago, said, Alan, I want to have lunch with you. Why? <laughs> just want to have lunch with you. You're an interesting guy. So Alan and I have lunch with each other, and we, we stay in touch with each other. We, we really enjoy talking to each other. So just, again, somebody I thought was interesting that might expand my horizon a little bit. Make sure you don't do the things you don't want to do. You know, I've gotten asked to do some things. I was asked to do something uh, in our state here with the transition, and I got excited about doing it because I got asked, because sometimes you want to be asked. The more I thought about it, the more I realized I was going to mess up everything else I wanted to do. So don't do the things you don't want to do. Um, Many people don't follow through. I've had a lot of people approach me, gee, we really want you to do this. We really want you to, you know, to do I'll give you one of my big disappointments. Duke University, the business school, came at me and really wanted me to do an active role with them and do this, do this. And I went down to a couple times, and they just dropped the ball. And after them, me pursuing it for a while, and them back and forth, and they just dropped the ball. I'm not going to pursue it. You know, I'm at a point in my life, I don't need that. So I can do other things. So I, you know, but a lot of people don't follow through. A lot of people talk the talk, but they don't follow through. I pretty much, just because of who I am, I get up every day with a plan. So I want to have something that's, you know, here's what is going to, it drives Carolyn crazy some days. You know, I'll say, what's on your list? I don't have a list. <laughs> so, well, okay, I want to check my list off as I go through the day. You know, and it might be some work I need to get done. It might be, you know, it just might be go out in the yard. I was telling somebody earlier, I went out the other day and, 
I had a pampas grass that I wanted to move from here to here. That ended up being a project for the day because by the time I did that, moved this one, moved that one. But now you realize you've got the time to do that. And I was telling Todd earlier, because we both do a little bit of woodworking, he does a lot. You know, you can set the project down and you can come back to it tomorrow. So you don't have to rush yourself through things. So it's nice to have that time not to be rushed, but I do make lists and kind of check off that it's been a great day because I've accomplished all these things. Yippee. I, I have found one thing is I'm much better at the things I'm doing as a volunteer, and I'm on a number of boards still as a volunteer. And I used to be there with half my brain, because half my brain was at Cone, worrying about what was going on, just like you, half would be baked you know, on patients or whatever your job would be. And now when I'm on the, I'm on the board at a and and when I'm there, I'm on the board at A&T. You know, I'm really focused. And so I'm, that's kind of neat. You know, it's kind of neat to be better at that focus than being so distracted. And my final, final thought on this before I just kind of give you a list of what's worked and what hasn't is check in frequently with your spouse. Duh. Um, we actually plan together and we kind of make these uh, wild kind of, gee, we want to do this, we want to do that. We'll kind of make a list of them. And then we sit down about once a month every six weeks and have a glass of wine and go, okay, what's working, what's not working? You know, we agreed early on that we were not going to be around the house together all day long, so frequently don't see each other until 2 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon. But we do sit down and kind of pull things out. I see the Murray's back there. Kim's <laughs> elbowing Bob. <laughs> and we, we sit down and talk about what, what do you want to do more of? What do you want to do less of? What haven't we done that we wanted to do? And so we kind of plan out and try to use a six-month kind of rolling planning horizon of things we might want to do. So what's worked and what wasn't? What have I done? Well, I said I want a time, more, more time in Colorado. I've done that. I've gone skiing the last couple, three years. More time with grandkids. Done that. Hobbies. Um, we probably all have hobbies that we've abandoned. In my case, um, I used to do a lot of hiking. I hadn't hiked in a long time or done much. I grew up as a kid bird hunting. I had to find a network of people who were into bird hunting. So now I've been to Montana. I've been to South Dakota three times. I've been duck hunting two or three times. I joined a hunt club right on the Virginia border. Uh, bought a few guns, which has caused a little controversy at home. Um, so I've done a lot, a lot, you know, that was something I wanted to get back to that I did as a kid. Went moose hunting with my brother last fall, something he's always wanted me to go do with him. I'm doing it again this fall. I'm hiking the John Muir Trail this summer to get back to the backpacking mode. Playing more golf hasn't been a priority. As one of my friends says, Tim, you still have to improve a lot just to suck. <laughs> True. Um, I'm still, you know, I still, I, I'm still hesitant to play with people because it's just not that good. Although Carolyn and I enjoy doing it together some. Biking, because I, I bought a bike because my feet were worn out from running, so there's a good biking community in the community. I see a lot of, I see Bruce Brody out there. I see a number of other folks that uh, enjoy biking with. I wanted to get back into cooking. I do a lot of cooking, so that's something I hadn't done. I mentioned I work with Brad Seaman all day today, and I learn from people. There's some cool cooking classes you can take to, to, to get better at this. On my list was to go back to music. Many people don't know this. I started my life as a music major, and I haven't done that. I have played the piano a little bit, but the trumpet still has rust on it. I want to do some direct volunteer work, so I'm doing some of that with the church group, but not everything I wanted to do. And one area we haven't done as much as we thought we'd do is travel. It's interesting, everybody says, as soon as I retire, I want to travel. We've done, you know what we've done and we've discovered? We've done a lot of road trips. When's the last time you took a road trip? I'm talking about getting in the car and going someplace 10 days in the car with not necessarily an end point in mind. And that's been a lot of fun. Now, we've, had, we've gone from here to Minneapolis where our daughter lives with our grandkids, but we've had no plan in between. Do you know there's a quilting museum in Pulaski, Kentucky? <laughs> Don't go there. <laughs> Drop your wife and there's a good IPA right around the corner where you can go. go. But anyway, you know, that's something we've enjoyed. We haven't done the big trips to Europe or things like that, but we've done a lot of stuff that we have kind of wouldn't have done, you know, used to be get in the car and get from point A to point B on the freeway as fast as you can. Professionally, I wanted to stay relevant in healthcare. Interestingly, I thought I'd have a lot of hard time leaving Cone and the people of Cone. I miss the people, but I've intentionally tried to stay away from Cone itself, so I do some things in the community. For Terry, I've worked on the Union Square and some things like that, but not anything directly with Cone. And that's actually worked out pretty well for me. Uh, stay relevant in the community, so there's opportunities in our community, lots of opportunities for all of us. Um, teaching was an area that hasn't worked out as well as I thought it would. And one thing that I'm really enjoying is mentoring young people. There's a lot of folks in our medical systems that want to pick your brain, have coffee with, with you or whatever. 
There's also a lot of entrepreneurs in our community. And so I have spent some time with the Chambers Entrepreneurial Group and probably have about 10 or 12 young entrepreneurs that are starting companies, working on their products, some that have healthcare connections, some who don't. But they're kind of fun to be around young people and have them pick your brain. So that's a little bit of you know, what's worked, what hasn't worked. Uh, for me, I have to be very intentional about it. I have to uh, stay busy. I like to have lots of balls in the air. Um, I've had to learn how to do this without an assistant. And that's not worked out. I showed up for a, a beer one night with a friend of mine, and he didn't show up. So I sat there and sat there and sat there. Finally, I ordered a sandwich. Waited, waited, waited. One of the nurses from Cone came up and said, Tim, it's really sad now that you're retired. You have to come sit here and spend the night by yourself. <laughs> so that was my mistake on the calendar. Abby, come join me. We'll take some questions. We can e take questions. I had one, one thing that I was going to uh, kind of leave you with before we take questions, if that's okay. That's fine. So um, you heard Tim say, be intentional over and over and over again. I think that that is the biggest takeaway that I would encourage you to grab hold of is this is your choice. You know, whether you're ready now, you're ready in five years, 10 years, 20 years, whenever it is, whenever you do it, it's to be intentional. And don't let retirement happen to you. So I was going to close with a, um, from the 128 Tips book, there's two books over there. Uh, this is one. I'm, I want to close by reading you tip number 108. Going cold turkey into retirement is for the birds. While the idea of moving from 60 hours per work week to zero hours has some people saying, sign me up for that. And for others, the idea sends a cold chill down their spine. Regardless of which camp you fall into, going cold turkey into retirement is tough. Instead, create a transition timeline that incorporates the things that are important to you. This ensures you can make a positive adjustment to the changes in schedule and inevitable shifts in relationships, roles, and responsibilities. So it closes with, what is important to you in the next phase of life? Build that in now, and transition becomes easy. So, so questions? John. First of all, I'd like to thank you and Tim for coming. Beautifully orchestrated, the messages were, were from the heart, so thank you. Um, you. You keep mentioning intention, um, and intention means having a timeline. How soon is too soon to think about this? Ooh, that's, a great, that's a great question. I am, unfortunately, I run into CEOs finally, uh, of, of CEOs mostly, that say, gee, I'm thinking about retirement in six months. I said, what have you done about it? Nothing. Just thinking about it. So does your board know? Well, how are they going to plan for succession? I mean, does your spouse, you know, I've talked to my spouse a little bit. Well, what's your plan? What are you, you know, what are you thinking about? What you, so I don't know. I think, in, I'll, I'll give you my case. I think to do a search to replace an executive can take a year to do that. So I had to give notice at least six months ahead of that so they could start that process. Now, we were fortunate Terry was here, and we had a, you know, so that all worked out really well. But I still had to give him that heads up. Now, the flip side of that is I didn't want to say thing, anything too early because I didn't want to be a lame duck. And I will tell you personally, it was one of the scariest discussions I had in my life with my board because there's no going back. I went in there, went into executive session, my palms were sweaty, and I said, you know, four or five of you know this because we've been talking about that, but it's my intention to retire December 31, 2014. And I was like, okay, it's out. And we talked a little bit through that. They, they spent two minutes trying to talk me out of it and immediately started talking about Terry and what the next plan was. <laughs> so I realized you can't take it back. I mean, you, you can't do a do-over on that. So that was, that was my situation. I don't, as a physician, I don't know um, with your group in terms of planning to replace you. I think more time is better than less time just from what I've seen from people. But I don't, I don't know what your professional advice would be there. Well, um, Thank you. So uh, the way I would answer that question is I typically tell people three to five years at a minimum. And the reason I say three to five years is that uh, oftentimes it will take, as Tim said, some time to find that successor. But there's also this emotional process that you have to go through and they have to go through. And so as you work through that, part of it is just getting 
ready for that next phase and getting the, the company and the people in those leadership roles ready for that next phase. But the other funny thing that I'll tell you is there's this uh, concept that uh, a guy named Patrick Ungashik shared with me, and I like it. It's called the Rolling Ten. And so I do a lot of Vistage presentations, and those are groups of CEOs that meet once a month, and they talk about their issues and work through problems together that they have in their business. And so when I do a program for these folks, I usually ask them, so when are you planning to exit your business? And no matter whether they're 40 years old or they're 60 years old or 70 years old, they always say five to 10 years. And then I see them again in about three years, and I say, so when are you planning on exiting your business? And they say, eh, five to 10 years. And then I see them again in three, well, you know where it's going, right? So that's, that's the problem is that even when you say three to five years, it can become 10. So get started so that you're ready when the time is right. I think it also depends on what you want to do and your health and a lot of other factors and your family. And, and I wanted to be very active and I want to retire when I'm young enough to have a, another chapter. I have a good, good colleague, friend of mine, who his life is his work and he's in his early 70s and he plans to be carried out of his office because he doesn't know what he would possibly do next. So I think it depends on your situation. But. Enjoy your talk so far, coming from the heart. The question that I had in all your studies that you've done, the people who've taken the plunge, I see Tim here mentioned that he stayed somewhat engaged in the healthcare system. The people who went totally out of what they're used to for all their life and try something differently, how many people actually stayed there or needed to stay connected and came back, in this case would be like in healthcare. And we're happy with that transition into totally something never done and disconnected that umbilical cord. What well, I'll you? tell you a guy who blows me away is Bruce Brody. I mean, you talk about a guy who was a stud in the cardiology world and walked away from cardiology and pretty much cut the cord. And I think, Jonathan, people tried to get him to come back and do things, and the answer is no. And he's doing his photography, his biking, and he is writing a book. I mean, he's just as happy as can be. Um, I also could name you a name you know who retired and came back and it, you know, just wasn't happy and had to come back and pick up his OB privileges and work for a long time uh, because that's what he knew. So I don't know that there's... Well, you know, what I find is that the skills and experience that you all have is very transferable. You tend not to look at it that way because that's the only way that you've used those skills and experience. A good but point. Everything that you've done over the course of your career is transferable to some other type of work or some other type of activity. You just don't look at it that way. And early on when I was going through phase one, when I said it was so exciting for so many people and enlightening, that's part of why, is because you start to say, hey, wait a minute, these skills that I've honed as a physician, the same listening skills, you know, those of you that are good listeners as physicians, those same listening skills are the skills that can be applied to a nonprofit board or could be applied to, you know, a photography class or something like that. It's the same skills matter. So that's how I would answer it. Brad Siemens, by the way, offered me a job as a sous chef today because, you know, you're pretty damn good chopping vegetables. So, yeah. said, so, you know, can you to No. No. I learned a lot just being there for a day with him, though. Anything else? Yeah, Sunny? Address the spouse. Yeah, so um, I'll tell you some things about the spouse. It's really interesting. Um, a lot of what I just talked about this evening is uh, much more difficult for men than for women. And the reason is because over the course of women's careers and over the course of their lives, they have had to take on many, many different roles. And for many of them who have had children, they've been out of the workforce, sometimes for a very short period of time, you know, a couple weeks, some of them for a much longer period of time. But they're used to adapting to different roles and taking on that. And I think that many women, it's not all the all the time the case, but many women will enjoy spending more time with their grandkids, you know, than uh, a lot of men will. But the, the biggest challenge, I think, for both um, husband and wife is figuring out what that's going to look like when they're not working anymore. All of the life patterns, all of the habits, all of the behaviors that have, you have built as a unit for, you know, 30, 40 years of marriage are now shifting, and you've got to figure out how to recreate that. And I think Tim and Carolyn have done a remarkable job at figuring that out. And he's shared a little bit of why, but you can talk more about that. No, I'm, Sonny, we knew early on we didn't want to spend all day together. But <laughs> um, she has a lot of interests that outside, and that, you know, that I have different interests, so that works out really well. 
The interesting thing was I hadn't thought about the fact that I was never home for dinner. So all of a sudden we're home for dinner all the time. You know, I'm home for dinner. And that actually works well because I like to cook and so we trade off on doing that. But that was like, we really have enjoyed that. And so we didn't, we'd never watch the news together. I mean, rarely. But some of those little things we kind of rediscover that we enjoy doing. But the, the and, and a lot of people here with your call schedule and stuff, the never home for dinner one was a ton, didn't occur to me how many nights a week we all are at these meetings and doing things. Then also we're like, my God, we've got to figure out how we're going to eat. <laughs> so I think it's very, I, I, we've been pretty intentional about working together on it. Thank you for that question. John? So Tim, I'm retiring in 237 days and hours. <laughs> Are you available for networking? Hey, you know, I was actually, actually I thought about that. It's, a, it's really easy, and I know most people in here. Tim Rice Consulting at gmail.com. <laughs> or I can give you my cell number. Yeah, because I, I, you wouldn't believe the number of people I've talked to nationally who have no plan, no clue, many who now have Abby's number. <laughs> But, Thank and you don't you. have to use Abby. I don't mean to, right, right. no, I mean just to, but to be intentional, to think through your skills, your desires, what you want to be, and, and what you want that life to look like. And uh, I also have a friend, we may be thinking about the same friend whose desire, I said, what are you going to do the next six months? Run around the house in my underwear. You know, and I just don't think that's a good plan. <laughs> <laughs> Particularly in his case. <laughs> you, you can modify that, just don't shave every other day. <laughs> well, Bill, um, I won't tell you what I looked like until 3 o'clock today. <laughs> so one of my goals is not to wear a tie. Oh. So I, I finally did it two weeks ago. I found a not-for-profit that took about 20 suits, probably about 50 shirts, and about 60 ties. Because I've just been moving them around the closet and not using them. And I still got lots more than I should get rid of. But that was like a big separation for me to, to give those suits to most of the young guys who are trying to go out and interview and find jobs. And so I finally got rid of those things. Um. I would say that we've all been blessed to be in medicine, and, but the environment is changing. The, the elephant in the room, burnout, do you have any comments about its impact as coming to retirement? It's a great question, particularly physician burnout. There's a lot of work going on nationally through the National Center for Healthcare Leadership, and the current administrative fellow, Cynthia Garcia, is actually going to work with Mary Jo on a project and on physician burnout. But it is a big concern. There's a, there's a body of work nationally that's, that's uh, going on right now. And I'll tell you, the other place you see it is executives, healthcare executives. I mean, just throw your hands up and just go, geez, what's going to happen tomorrow? Because we can't predict you know, what's around the corner. So I see a huge wave of retirement, uh, not just on the physician side, but on the, on the healthcare executive health plans, tremendous amount of pressure pressure in our, and stress in our environment. Mary Jo, do you have anything to say on the physician burnout piece? I know you got some work going on. Well, actually, Andy Lamb is leading that work, so we've got the real expert in the room here. So I, I do think, can you guys hear me? So we actually started some work about two years ago, and that's interesting. And Kelly, I, I just saw you, Kelly. So Kelly and Andy are leading that work, and that arose from our Physician Leadership Academy as well. So um, I think you will all be hearing more and more work about that. But as it relates to retirement, I do think that we may see uh, perhaps some physicians retiring earlier than they might have otherwise done because of the whole burnout yeah. piece that's there. So. From, from the point of view of the lecture tonight around retirement, I do think we're going to see some physicians, some of whom have talked to me in this room, that, that, w that may retire earlier than they might have otherwise thought about doing that as a result of the burnout. We are doing some work this year. There's a targeted piece of work that Kelly and Andy are leading around our ED docs and cardiologists. They're focusing in uh, Alamance with the ED docs, but working with uh, our heart care docs and cardiology uh, in targeting uh, the measures of burnout and what interventions could be helpful to alleviate that. And as what we learn from that group of docs, we'll then be beginning to spread that from what we learned there. So I'm thankful to them for taking that on and trying to do it in a measurable way that we can look and see, is this effective? Uh, the literature also shows that what's, wor what's causing burnout in one specialty may not be the same thing in another, and the, um, the methods that you're going to use to alleviate the symptoms 
may need to be different in one specialty versus another. So, the good news is we're not on not in this alone. You probably didn't even know the national. The, the, the I just connected Cynthia with this group this week. I had coffee with her like last week. Um, we're not in this alone. I mean, it's no. a big issue. Our friends up at Carilion and Roanoke are also in the middle of this work through the National Center of Healthcare Leadership. So Cynthia's going to be making those connections to try to get best practices and bring that. It's a big issue. Odell. Yes, Tim, you and Abby, knowing both of you all for interesting about 10 to 15 years. Question though, what does the statistics say nationally about when you retire and leave your community and say we go to wherever with the grandkids and all of a sudden you've kind of separated in a couple ways. We've worked very hard to separate our self-worth away from our job. We've been working on that for years, talking about myself. However, I like this community. So to pick up and go to another community, how, how does that affect? What does the sister say about that, Abby? Yeah. <laughs> we're in the middle of that. We're, we're right in the middle of that because um, we spend a couple, a little bit of time in Breckenridge, Colorado. The good news is nobody has a clue who you are. The bad news is nobody has a clue who you are. <laughs> and in Greensboro, you know, you, you know people. You go out to a restaurant, you see people, and it's very collegial, and you bump into, you know, it's great walking in here tonight and see a lot of friends. So we're trying to figure that out because we, as much as we love Greensboro, we don't have any family here. My family's all in the state of Washington, and they're a lot of times saying, why are you staying in North Carolina? So we're trying to figure that out ourselves. It's a very interesting dichotomy. But you pick up and you don't, you know, you, you talk about leaving that persona, because I left that persona, a lot of people would, will still say to me, oh, you were Mr. Moses Cone. You know, you kind of like, you know, you want to be Tim. But then you also like part of what used to come with that. Yeah, I think there's a huge identity that we all have in our work, but there's also a huge identity that we have in the community within which we live. And so when we are separating from that identity, you've got to replace it with something. And one of the exercises that I often have people do, if that seems to be an issue for them, is have them identify what are the things that gave them value in their workplace and in their community, and then what are the ways they're going to get uh, same kind of value in either the new community or the new work life or no work life. And if they can make that transition ahead of time, you know, part of it is just emotional stuff of how do I think through what it's going to be like. And then the second part of it is actually doing it. But if you can get through it emotionally first and then execute against it, you're in much, much better shape. If you don't do that correlation between the two then, what I see happens a lot is that the family, the, the retired person that moves to be near their young family, well, that's a real problem because now they're demanding all kinds of things from the family, and the family has their own life. I mean, their kids are going to school, they have soccer and basketball and all this kind of stuff, and now it's like, well, can we come over for dinner tonight? Well, I just saw you last night. I know, but we're your grandparents, you know? And so it's hard, and they've got to find their own, their own path. And, it's not always easy to do if they won't face it. So it's a great question. We have found in a new community that you dropped into where you don't know anybody, it's hard to figure out how to get things done. We all know people here. and We all know how to get stuff done and how to cut corners and, you know, particularly within medicine, how to get somebody seen and, and you get into a new community. So that's a, that's a great question that we kind of fear. But what we found we've, in spending a little bit of time in our place in Colorado is it's not that hard to start to make, you know, we call somebody and say, well, do you know how to get, do you know somebody could do this? Oh, you know, oh yeah, okay, well, let me help you. So it can be done, but it's a, it's a hurdle. Thank you. Any Anybody other questions? Else? Well, thank you for spending the time with us. Uh, I think both of us are really touched that you, yes, you did it. Thank you.